You got to be careful whose jersey you wear, I found out this morning. Uh, besides the referee jokes uh, and wearing glasses, etc., cetera, um, someone said, hey, I, th- I thought you were Don Kluver. <laughs> Which is a compliment, so thank you very much. And uh, actually, it is from Don Kluver, so uh, you probably saw him wearing this at some point, this exact shirt, so I, I could see why you mistook mistook us for the same person. Uh, I have had the opportunity uh, one time to, uh, to be a referee uh, at a basketball game. And, uh, you know, I, growing up in Hillsboro, full disclosure, uh, growing up in Hillsboro, they teach you from a very young age to uh, participate in the refereeing of basketball games. I mean, that just goes with growing up there, and uh, I am very good at it. I, I took all the right classes, and, and, but uh, as I got older, I, I continued to have some of those same traits uh, in my life until as, uh, um, I don't, I'm not sure how old I was, and perhaps you would say it really didn't have much of an effect on me, but I think it changed my perspective completely. Uh, I refereed a, a sixth grade basketball game, and um, it's so much easier to see things from the stands than it is actually when you're on the court. That, that's probably the main thing that I learned uh, in that one time. And uh, I've never forgotten it. Like I said, uh, I think I've toned down since my younger years. Uh, other people might, might argue that. But um, it changes your perspective when, when you have to be out there on the floor. So uh, full disclosure on my, my referee and skills. Great to have you here this morning. We are in Philippians chapter 3. We're looking at verses 7 to 11. As always, I invite you to follow along. There's a, there's a Bible that's there in your row. Uh, we're on page 952 of the blue Bible in your row. So please take your Bibles, turn there, and uh, we're going to bow and pray. I'm just going to invite you again to ask the Spirit to speak to you. Uh, this week, uh, one of the songs that God laid on my heart was, um, was that song, I Stand Amazed. And uh, I hope that not just through the singing, but through all the things that we do this morning, that uh, we would be amazed by who God is, that we'd be amazed by uh, the things that, that he's about, and that we would see him through that as well. So would you bow your heads and please pray with me? Dear Lord, we pray for your spirit to quiet our hearts. It's one thing for us to to stop talking and start listening. It's another thing for those things to to penetrate um, to the core of who we are and allow your spirit uh, to work within us. Lord, we, we bring with us all that was this past week and and we have this next week on our minds as well and so lord we don't get rid of those things we ask you to speak into those things uh, to guide us uh, to continue to mold us we're on a we're on a journey while we're here on this planet and we continue to to trust you to guide us uh, to direct us to open our eyes to reveal new things and and to remind us of the things that we already know as well so lord as we look at these verses as as we think about how they might apply within our own lives the things that that you would have specifically for each one of us uh, i trust your spirit to meet us right where we're at to guide us to your knowledge And I thank you in advance for the things that that you will do, and may you be glorified. ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the past three weeks, we've we've seen three different individuals described for us. If you remember, going back into chapter 2, there were two individuals that, that Paul said, these people, Timothy and Epaphroditus, Be watching them. They shine like stars in the darkness. And again, the examples that we are given are are reminders that as believers, we're called to to stand out compared to what's going on 
in the world, the world being that which is set opposed to who Jesus is. And when we follow the things that God's called us to, when we continue to allow the Spirit to guide us, that stands out. That's a light in the midst of darkness. When, when we looked at Timothy, Paul talked about things like he had genuine concern for others. He also talked about the fact that, that he and Timothy had a father and son relationship, and it, it wasn't just as a father saying, hey, hey boy, go do that. No, it, it was as a father and a son who went and, and worked together. They did ministry together. There was a bond. It, w- it was family. When we talked about Epaphroditus, you remember that there were the, there were the six characteristics or the, the six people that you could see in Epaphroditus' life. I have those here uh, on the overhead for us. Those, those were ideas as we look at what does it mean to, follow, to be a follower of Christ that, that we can say, oh, it means being a brother. We're all family. It means being a sister. We're together. We love one another. Maybe don't always get along. Maybe don't always treat each other right. But, but we're family. We work through those things. And so on. As, as he went through that list of, of who Epaphroditus was and the things that, that Paul saw in his life. Then, then Paul talked about himself. And we had another six descriptions of Paul and his life. Talking about who he was. The things that he trusted in. The first three describing what it meant to be a Hebrew, growing up in the, in the family that he was in, circumcised as part of the, the people of Israel, Israel as a Jew, from the tribe specifically of Benjamin. He knew the law. He had been a Pharisee. He was very zealous in not only knowing the law, but then, I'd say using the word, he enforced the law. To the, to the extent that he persecuted, he killed those who didn't follow the law. He was the guy. And then he was very righteous. He knew those rules. He obeyed the rules. And when he looked at his own life, the things that he was trusting in for a relationship with God, he said, it's not there. That's not where it's at. And as we go into these verses, verses 7 to 11, really what he does is expound on the idea that what he trusted in in the past and what God was calling him to were different. And he uses the terms winning and losing. Well, he, he talks about the word gain. He uses all these things were gain. But he specifically talks about the idea of, of, of losing. Today, as, as you're watching the football game, more people will watch the football game today than any other event that's on TV throughout the year. Knowing the difference between what it means to win and what it means to lose is important. We, we kind of presuppose that, right? That, that it, we know that it, the team that's going to win is the one that will score more points. And, and we understand, hey, that's, that touchdown area, that's, that's the goal. That's what we're all shooting for. They're not sitting there saying, oh, whoever has the most yards at the end of the game, they're going to win. Or maybe we'll just go by the flip of the coin, right? It's by chance. And whoever gets the coin flip at the beginning, they're the winners. We'll just declare them at the beginning. We'll save ourselves all that time. We'll just go back to eating. No, they've decided this is what it means to win and lose. And in the Christian life and in life in general, Paul talks about this is what it means to win and this is what it means to lose. And so we're going to look here specifically at the things Paul describes. We're going to start with verses 7 to 9a. They talk about what it means to lose. Paul lays this out very, very clearly. He says this. We'll read all nine. Excuse me. We'll read all three of these verses. But whatever were gains to me, so whatever was a win in the past, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. In verse 7, Paul says, but whatever were gains, whatever I used to consider as a win, I now 
see as a loss. There was a change in his thinking. There was a reassessment and a transformation that had taken place in Paul's life. Why had there been this change? He doesn't say it specifically here, but we know that, that Paul came to know Christ. As we look back here to the eight things that, or excuse me, the six things that describe who Paul was, he was persecuting the Jews, or excuse me, he was persecuting the Christians, and, and he was making their life horrible. But on the road to the Damascus, all, the, all of those things changed. And in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 5, it says, as Saul, and Paul's name before he gave his life to Christ was Saul, it says, as Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. His whole life was consumed with enforcing and wanting others to do exactly what he told them to do, what he expected of them. It was based in his own self-righteousness. But on the road to Damascus, that all changed. As he saw Jesus, and he was confronted with what he was actually doing. And after that encounter, it led to a new understanding. He called everything that he had been in his past loss. And verse 8 says, what is more, now I consider everything a loss. So while there might have been those six things that made him who he was, the more he learned and understood who Jesus is and, and what it mean, meant to follow after him, it's like he said, if I could put everything that I own, because when we talk about everything, that means everything, right? So th that's all. All of what he had, if that was all over here, and then he just had that one thing over here, which was knowing Christ. If he, if he could put those in two separate categories, he says, I, I, I'm getting rid of all of this. I only want to know Jesus. I only want to know him. All includes everything. As J.D. Greer has said in, in the book that we've been studying uh, as pastors, uh, Jesus continue, Continued, uh, J.D. Greer says, you can never know that Jesus is all that you need until he's all that you have. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know if I've ever been to a point in my life where I would say, Jesus is all that I've ever needed. Now, I I know that I can't save myself, but as far as being to the end of everything that I have, I continue to surround myself with these things. Right? The, they're not necessarily bad, but do I put them in front of knowing Jesus? Are they my priority? Do I, do I stand over here with these things as my priority, or is Jesus my priority? Paul says that here he is, he's in jail. Everything that he's had has been taken from him. And he says... I don't have anything else. And, and he was literally, he didn't have anything else. All he had was Jesus. I've, I've never been there. So, some of you understand that better than I do because of losses that you've experienced in your life. Maybe it's been literally someone passing away. Or perhaps in your marriage, you, you've gone through that and experienced what it feels like to, to be at the end of yourself and not know what to do next and wonder where God is and saying, I, I need you, I, I got to depend on you only. Maybe your, your checkbook, even this morning, shows zero, or less than zero. I haven't been to those spots. I, I don't know all of those things. I continue to want to know Jesus as my all in all, as my only thing. I, I don't necessarily want to lose all these things either. Do you ever feel that? Like, I, I don't want to lose all of what I have in, under, in order to understand that he's all I need. But that's part of the journey that we're on, correct? Is we continue to, to seek and to, and to depend on Christ to provide for that. I continue to, to stand over here. This is where I want to be, but I, I feel like I keep having my hand over here saying, well, but it's really nice to have some of these things as a part of what I have and, and sustain myself. But in my heart, I, I want to know. I want to know. I, we strive after that. Paul uses the phrase that he forfeited, that he had nothing. 
And for the second time, he uses the word consider. The first time he says, I consider everything a loss. The second time he talks about everything that he has, he says, I consider them garbage. I consider them garbage. Paul put the translators that would follow him in a quandary. Okay, I don't know if you knew this. When, when Paul says, I consider these things garbage or rubbish, he put the translators of the letter that he actually wrote in a quandary because Paul was offensive in the word that he used. He used the word skabellon, skabellon. And that's a vulgar term in, in the Greek language. It's a vulgar term. He used strong language. In the Roman era, they had something called the skabellon pit, I have a picture for that for you back there. It was a two-seater, by the way, if you notice. There's two Scabellan pits. Okay, do you understand what Scabellan is? That's where you would go to relieve yourself in the Scabellan pit. And so the translators, they're like, I don't, can we write that word? Right? I thought of my responsibility even as your pastor talking about how strongly do I translate that word for you? I'm going to give you the freedom to translate it however you choose. But you need to know the word that Paul is talking about. When the Philippians read this, they're talking about excrement, okay? They're talking about human waste. That's what Paul says, okay? That's what Paul says. He says, these things over here, this pile over here, that's the pile that we're talking about, Scabellin. Paul says to the readers in Philippi, not just that their faith in themselves, the things that they've done, their own self-righteousness, it's not just that it's worthless. He's also saying that it's offensive. It stinks. When we believe the things that we can do make us good enough for God, that's offensive. Because the cross is all about the fact that because this is worthless, that's why he went there. That's why he went there. That's why he went to the cross, because we, in our own selves, and all the good things that we try to do to be good enough for God to love us. Paul was saying, I was trying to save myself, and it's all scabellin. It's all garbage, rubbish, waste. It's all over there. The sad part is, is, we continue to do that even after we've given our life to Christ. So p perhaps you've tried to work your way to, to being good for Jesus, that, that, that you might have salvation someday. But maybe along the way you, you come to understand, oh, it's not based on works, it's based on faith. That it's not about what I do, it's about who he is. But even once we give our lives to Christ, like I'm talking about where I, I stand over here saying, it's not about me, I want to know him, I want to have faith in him. I still continue to get pulled this way. I get sucked over here because I continue to think God only loves me if I do good things. And, and I know that I, I put other things before him. And, and so I have to continue to be reminded, I would say daily, that the things that I do, the person that I am, it's important, but I'm, I'm saved by who he is and what he did on the cross. And now the actions that I have, the way that I treat people, the choices that I make, that I make, I want to continue to reflect who Jesus is. But, but I continue to think, oh, I look pretty good, though, if I do this. And, and I, I got to do that, or Jesus is not going to be pleased with me. And Paul, for the unbeliever and for the believer who says, I want to feel so much better about myself, he says, no, it's about who Jesus is. It's not about your own righteousness. It's not about your own righteousness. Paul tells us that it's scabellin. Get rid of it. And then he shifts from looking at what does it mean to lose to winning, to winning. So let's look at verses 9 and following, the second half of that. I'll, maybe I'll start there at the beginning of verse 9. It says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but, and this is where we go to the winning part when he uses the word but, instead, that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so 
somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, my life is about knowing Christ. His desire for life, his motivation is to continue to grow in, his knowledge, in, in the knowledge that he had of Jesus. Are there three things that you might say in your life that, that you have as goals, things that you want to experience while you're here on earth? Is there, is there some place you want to travel to maybe and get to see? Maybe you, it was a year ago about that, that Sally and I started preparing to go visit Cassidy in Spain. Going to Europe and being able to see all, I'd say that's one of the top experiences that I've had in my life. Maybe one of the experiences that, one of the things that's on your bucket list is, is someday you want to you wanna go skydiving. Or, or maybe you want to swim with the dolphins. Or, or, or maybe you want to win the Super Bowl, right? I mean, we all have these experiences or these goals that we're reaching after and saying, man, before, before my life here on earth is done, I, this is what I need to experience. Paul is going to talk about three things in knowing God and following after Jesus, three experiences that he would have. First one is to experience the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. When Paul is talking about this, he's not talking about someday being risen from the dead. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He's talking about a present reality in his life. When he says, I want to feel the power of the resurrection, he's talking about when, when we're here at church, when, when we go have the meal, when we walk out and go to our homes or go to our work or wherever it is that we go from here. He says, as I'm walking around doing life, I want to feel the power of the resurrection in my life. What, what an amazing concept. There, there are areas of our life that are dead. I mean, think about even in relationships. There are, re, there are relationships that I need the power of the resurrection in. People that I used to talk to that maybe I, n- I never talk to anymore, that, that I, I've let that slide. Maybe it's with your children or your family. Maybe it's a coworker. But our lives need the power of the resurrection, the, the work of the Holy Spirit as, as we connect with others and that's, that's possible in Jesus Christ. That's not possible in our own strength. Second of all, he says that he also wants to participate in his sufferings. Man, as excited as, as I am about experiencing the power of the resurrection in my life today, uh, I look at or start thinking about what does it mean to participate in Christ's sufferings, and I say, I'm not sure if that's an experience I'm looking for. Uh, I want God to be powerful in my life to 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 resurrect areas of my life that are dead, uh, what does it mean to experience or participate in the sufferings of Christ? We know Jesus was insulted, mocked, beat, whipped, and then crucified. Why? Because he was a star that stood out in the darkness. Think about Paul's own life. I mean, he's writing from jail, but also in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24, he, he lays out some of the things that, that he's experienced in his life. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I, have, I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. What's Paul call that? Winning. He calls that winning. To suffer and to experience reflecting Jesus. He says that that's what I'm called to do is, is reflect Jesus. No matter what people say about me or how they treat me. Third, the promise of eternity. And this specifically now is looking at He's looking forward to the day, and we've read this in, in Philippians chapter 1. He, he wrestles with the idea of, man, I, I, I love being here, and I, I love the people within the church, he says, but I can't wait till the day that, 
that I will be in eternity with him. When all of the pain of sin, all of the things that are going around me, going on around me are gone, I, I look forward to that day. That's why when we talk about what is the power of salvation, what is the power of the resurrection means, that means there is joy in the life that we live now, and we also look forward to the day when, when someday we will be face-to-face with our Heavenly Father. Paul says these are the three experiences of knowing, of knowing God and allowing him to work in and through my life. So how about you? Have you given your life to Christ? Or if you have given your life to Christ, are you continuing as you go about that journey to say, it, it's about what I do. I, I gotta make sure that I get all of these ducks in a row. If I, then either I can save myself or God's gonna be happy with me if I do that. In the last couple weeks, as we talked about even Epaphroditus, I've been asked by individuals, well, there are those, those six things that, that Paul says Epaphroditus was all about. Um, where do I start? I mean, like, maybe you'd say, I, I, I'm none of those. Or, or I, I, I'm, I think I, I see two or three of those coming out in my life. But a, as I talk to God and I, I say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Let's say, for example, you'd say, God's calling me to be a risk taker, but, but I don't, I'm not sure where to start. Not to be a risk taker in order for God to be pleased with me, but, but because I never thought about the fact that he's calling me to be a risk taker. Well, what does that mean? Is, is there a, a class I should go to? What should I do? What does that look like? Well, as we've talked about with the, with the how to make disciples, right? It, it's not only knowing and doing, but it's also saying, God, lead me. Show me what it is that you'd have me to do. And I'd point you back to the, to the Christ acrostic. As we're called to be a risk taker, the first place I'd tell you to start it is by going back to scripture and saying, what does God say about what it means to be a risk taker? Is, is that what he's calling you to? And if he is, asking the Holy Spirit to empower you. What does he say? And knowing that you can't do it in and of your own strength. That comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Third, I I would ask you to consider, as a risk taker, what does it mean to reach the world? Maybe first glance you'd say, well, Brad means I I need to go and have my testimony put together and every person I run into, I hand them my testimony and I know the Romans road and I, it might be what he's calling you to. It, It might be just starting by praying for your neighbor. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is calling you to do or, or how he's calling you to step out, perhaps as a risk taker, but but that's the part of saying, as a risk taker, Lord, what are you calling me to do in my neighborhood? Or what are you calling me to do in my work? That's going to look different for you and, and perhaps the person that's right next to you. How do I reach the world? Fourth, as a risk taker, what, what is, how does that impact our worship? How does it, perhaps walking through the doors this morning, I, I was thinking, maybe walking through the doors this morning was you being a risk taker. Perhaps you've been burned by the church. You've been hurt by whether it's this church or another church, and just coming to this place is, is taking a chance, is taking a risk, is stepping out and saying, man, I, I know this is what God's calling me to, but I don't know that I necessarily want to do that. For, for myself, uh, when I think about what it means to be a, a risk taker in, in where I'm at in, in worship, my thought went to, um, even this morning, I love to clap. I spent eight years doing camp in Alaska. So I can clap to Kumbaya. You know, it doesn't matter how slow the song is. I'm into it. I, I love singing and being together and doing all that. But every once in a while, I, I get within my soul this desire to raise my hand. You know, I talk about surrendering, and I can do it like this when I'm standing up on stage. But in my own personal little bubble that was over here today uh, of where I'm standing, I'm like, sometimes I, I, it's, a, it's a risk in my mind to do that. I, I sometimes, and I, and I don't do it very often because that's risky to me. It might not be risky to you, but that's where I'm at as I think about what it means to be a risk taker. Fifth, serving others. Again, going back to your neighbors, it might be helping them where they're at. It might be here at the church, hearing a need and saying, man, 
I know the gifts that I have. I'd, I'd like to plug in there. Again, it, it's going to look different for each one of us. And, and six, the transparent relationship as a risk taker. You hear me talk about pornography on a regular basis as I stand here in, in front of you. Uh, not all of you are called to talk about your most personal struggles that you have from the stage. That's not what you're called to. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. But again, going back to what it means to be a risk taker, I know God's called me to talk about that. That's why I won't shut up about it, right? It, is this fact that knowing that we, I can be transparent and people still love me. It still amazes me, but it's the way his word talks about and what a spirit does. But maybe it's just getting a, having a friend and talking to them about where you're at and the things that you're struggling with. Maybe it's about sin, but maybe it's about the things that you're experiencing in your life as well. If there's a program, that's the program that I would call you to, is continuing to say, who is God calling me to be? What is he calling me to do? For each one of us, that's, that's going to look different at different times. We're all on a different journey. But those things don't make me better to God. Those things enable the Holy Spirit to, to work in and through me and continue to point me towards what does it mean to, to share that with others and to live that out as I go through my daily life. Those are the things that we're called to as a family. Those are the things that we're called to as a body of believers, to, to walk with one another and to continue to point to our Heavenly Father. Because if it's about the things that I'm doing, remember, Paul says, that's skabolin. Put that to the side. Continue to focus on who Jesus is and let that pour out of you. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for, for all that you've done. I continue to uh, doubt who I am in you, and yet you continue to remind me how much you love me and and the fact that I can be called your son. We can be called your daughters. In Christ, in your sacrifice on the cross, we can be a part of your family. I thank you for that, Lord, for the, for the ways that you continue to work in each and every individual that's here this morning. You have, you have not given up on anyone. You love us where you're at, where we're at, and you continue through the power of your spirit to, to call us to, to trust you and to step out in faith. Lord, part of, uh, of us giving of our tithes and offerings this morning is, is just, again, that reminder that you've given us everything. We give back to you and, and say thank you. I thank you for, uh, even as Bob reminded us this morning of, of, of last year and, and, and finishing the year well with our budget. That's not because of who we are, that's because of all that you have provided us, for us. And we say thank you once again. Use these offerings to your honor and glory. I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.